going to talk about quantitative bias analysis for better inference. The idea that we can actually do a lot better than we do right now. And it's not very hard to actually do a lot better than we're doing right now in terms of thinking about the impact that sources of systematic error, in this case, I'm going to show an example of misclassification, but any source of systematic error that is left over after you've done your regression analyses. And I think if we do that, we're going to do much better as a field at getting results that actually help improve the lives of populations. I also want to know, does anybody know this bar? This is here in Berlin, and I found it in 2014, and I was so happy, and I tried to show it to other people, and nobody else cared. So I just looked it up. They do still exist. So you can go there and have a, a drink. Apparently, it's a Cuban restaurant. So what I want to talk about is exposure misclassification as a way to sort of think about misclassification in general. And I'm going to talk about misclassification, not sort of the more general measurement error that we could talk about. Uh, and when I say that, I mean, I'm not going to focus on continuous variables. I'll stick to categorical variables, particularly dichotomous variables. But everything that I say can be extended to other variables. And I'll use that to think about simple and probabilistic bias analyses as ways to think through how we can get quantification of the impact of sources of systematic error. And I just want to highlight the website there. So we do have a textbook in which we explain all of the methods that I'm going to use, but you don't have to buy the textbook. I mean, you know, my mom would really like it if you'd buy the textbook, but you don't have to buy the textbook. Our website contains all of the material, both spreadsheets and SAS code and R code that we have if you want to use these methods. So we do have a, a textbook um, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of use as material. But um, this was done in collaboration with colleagues Tim Lash and Elisa Fink in the first edition. And then we just put out a second edition in 2022 with Rich McElhose. So all of that information is there. But it's really the website that I want to point you to where I think you can find some hopefully useful material that goes along with the book. But you don't even need the book. So I want to start with this uh, paper by John Ioannidis. I'm going to assume that anybody who hasn't been here and heard me talk about this paper already has probably come across this paper, right? You don't publish a paper entitled Why Most Published Research Findings Are False and not create a lot of enemies, but also a lot of probably friends of people who subscribe to the idea that probably a lot of the research that we do in epidemiology is actually generating false positive research. And I'm not going to make too much of this article other than to say, Anidis lays out an argument here for why you can mathematically demonstrate that if you live in a world of no hypothesis significance testing and publication bias, where we just filter off the positive statistically significant findings, and then we layer onto that, residual selection bias, residual confounding, residual misclassification, information bias, then we have a system that is designed to come up with more false positives than true positives. I would argue that if we get out of the world of hypothesis testing, we could probably get away from some of this, but it doesn't mean that we, the general principle is incorrect, that we publish a lot of research that probably isn't actually doing anybody any good. And so we're going to think about how can we actually do better. So if you think about the way that research works, epidemiology works, we are sent out into the world, we write our grants, or we get funding from wherever to do our studies. And we go out and we collect data or we identify data sources that we can use. And we go out and analyze that data to answer some question that we think of as important to somebody in the world. We analyze that data and we try to design our studies so that we minimize random error. Or at least we think about random error, right? We have some quantification of random error. But then when it comes to systematic error, we 
kind of have one and only one thing that we do, which is we measure confounders and adjust for them, right? So I always like to think of the idea, like imagine you went out into the world and you said, I am gonna do the study of whether or not alcohol consumption causes lung cancer. And so I'm obviously gonna have to collect data on smoking in order to be able to do that. But imagine I do that, I collect the data, you know, I decide, you know what? I'm just gonna calculate a crude estimate of the effect of alcohol consumption on lung cancer, I'm not gonna adjust for smoking. But don't worry, what I will do instead is, I will go to the discussion section and list it as a limitation that we did not adjust for smoking. Would everybody in this room be okay with that? Presumably not. But that is what we do with every other source of systematic error, whether it be residual confounding, whether it be misclassification information bias, whether it be selection bias. And we talk about this in the discussion section. So this is a paper on the association of aspirin use with hepatocellular carcinoma and liver related mortality. And you go down to the end of their study, second to last paragraph, where you always find the limitation section. I told students earlier today, why the second to last paragraph? Because you don't want to end on a downer. So you put it in the second to last paragraph, and then you restate the conclusions that you've already stated in the first paragraph, completely ignoring all the limitations. So this one says, finally, despite the completeness of the prescribed drug register, misclassification of exposure is possible. However, any non-differential misclassification would most likely have underestimated the true association. And then, as I've said over and over, I am a strong believer in the theory that the most commonly used phrase in all of the epidemiologic literature is some form of non-differential misclassification, bias towards the null, we observed an effect, therefore, any effect that actually exists is greater, right? And we refer to this as the confessing your sins approach to epidemiology, right? As long as I tell you that I had some problem and a set of three or four anonymous reviewers agree, it's probably not so bad, then we publish it. Despite the fact that we have ways to actually quantify the impact. So doing this is equivalent to saying I have methods to be able to remove the confounding by smoking and the association of alcohol consumption and lung cancer, but I'll just discuss it rather than actually doing something about it. And I think we can do better. So if you think about the way that we typically work in epidemiology, the very first thing that we do, if we are any good at our jobs, is come up with a good study question, a question that can actually be answered with data. Then we design a study to be able to answer that question. And we attempt to minimize bias in the design. So we might use matching or restriction as a way of minimizing confounding. And then we calculate some summary measure. So we calculate a risk difference, risk ratio, hazard ratio, odds ratio, whatever. Then we quantify random error. So we calculate a p-value, a 95% confidence interval. But then we interpret our results almost exclusively based on estimates of random error, right? The conclusions generally come in the first paragraph. We restate them in the last paragraph, but we often really kind of draw the conclusions in the first paragraph of the discussion. Then we just, we ponder bias. Isn't it interesting? We may have had this problem we don't actually do anything about it. Despite the fact that the math that we need to be able to quantify the impact of sources of systematic error were worked out in the 1950s and 1960s around smoking and lung cancer. And they are incredibly simple. You can make them more complicated, but they are simple and straightforward. And yet we don't use them. So quantitative bias analysis is just a set of methods in which we attempt to quantify the impact of sources of residual systematic error. And we do that in terms of three axes, direction, magnitude, and uncertainty. Direction, 
meaning with the bias towards the null, away from the null. Magnitude meaning how much. And uncertainty, if I have to adjust, account for a source of systematic error in the analysis, if I didn't prevent it, there should be a penalty, right? I should always be less certain in my results if I have to account for it analytically than if I had prevented it in the first place. So we think about those three parameters when we think about the impact of residual sources of systematic error. And the general idea is, if, as I was taught, the objective of causal epidemiology, etiologic epidemiology, is to obtain a valid and precise estimate of the effect of an exposure on an outcome, then we have an obligation to quantify how much we deviated from the expectation for both the validity and the precision objective. We always quantify, we always quantify this is a random error, right? We, we always, with the exception of some very large studies, we always quantify random error, p-value or confidence interval. Maybe you're feeling frisky and you calculate a Bayes factor. I don't know. But you always put something in there. But when it comes to systematic error, we don't. But we can. And so bias analysis is going to go allow us to go beyond simply thinking about the impact of sources of systematic error and actually quantifying the impact under a set of assumptions about the deviations from the expectation. So you can do this for any source of residual systematic error. I'm just going to focus on misclassification. And this is an example that I love to show because I think it really illustrates the point of why it's really not a good idea to just simply say in your discussion, non-differential misclassification bias towards the null, so really don't worry about it. So what you're looking at here is a meta-analysis or I should say a systematic review of the studies that looked at the relationship between HPV and cervical cancer, and they're in chronological order. So they go from 1987 to 2003, and over that time, the tests to be able to detect HPV got better and better and better, right? In 1987, we weren't even in the PCR era. And the results look like this. So in 1987, 88, 89, we were measuring odds ratios in the neighborhoods of two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five, that's bad, right? If there's a threefold increased risk of cervical cancer associated with HPV, then that's a problem. We should do something about it. In 2003, we estimated risks of 800. 800 is a public health emergency. And we do something about it immediately. We develop a vaccine, which is what we did. So it's not enough to simply say non-differential misclassification bias towards the null. If we want to be able to make good policy decisions, if we want to be able to advise people on how to live their lives in ways that will maximize their potential of living healthy lives, we need to be able to give them not just is there an effect, we need to be able to give them a valid and precise effect. So we need to go beyond just saying there is bias, we need to quantify the impact of the bias. Now, when it comes to misclassification, we can differentiate non-differential and differential misclassification focused here on exposures. I know everybody in this room knows these terms, but I'm just going to review it so we all know we're on the same page. Non-differential, we simply mean for an exposure, the rate of misclassification of the exposure does not depend on the outcome. So both the sensitivity and the specificities of exposure classification are going to be the same in those with and without the outcome. Whereas if it's differential, the sensitivity and the specificities, at least one of them, maybe both of them, differ within levels of the outcome. So to illustrate how we can use quantitative bias analysis, I'm going to show you a study that was done by my colleague Eliza Fink, who was one of the authors of the first edition of the textbook. So Eliza in the early 2000s, was a, she, she's a, she was a cancer researcher studying breast cancer. And for her doctoral work, she wanted to study the question, what is the effect of smoking during pregnancy on the risk of incident breast cancer? 
the reason she wanted to do this was there had been one study done in 2001 or published in 2001. There was a case control study done by Innocent Buyers that found a five-fold, 4.8, five-fold increased odds associated with smoking during pregnancy on risk of incident breast cancer. And it was you know, one of the early studies, so she wanted to replicate this study with a similar design, case control study done in Massachusetts and Rhode Island using cancer registry data. And if you look on the right, that's what Elisa found, which is nothing. Similar design, completely different answer. In the buyers find five, Elisa finds basically the null. And you can see, even when she adjusted for confounders, the point estimate barely moves. So that's interesting, right? Why does one study using the same methodology as another study come to very different conclusions? But Eliza had a few problems. I'm only gonna focus on one, but there were a few different problems that she had to deal with because she went and presented this study. And if you're the second study, you're always gonna be compared to the first study. It's gonna be, what did you do wrong that you didn't get what they got? Or how is your study so much better that yours is right and theirs is wrong? But you're always gonna be compared. So she presented her study and it turns out she had a, a problem with misclassification. So when we think about misclassification, we think about it in terms of two sets of parameters, either predictive values or classification parameters. I'm not going to worry about predictive values because they're not as useful for what we're going to try and do. So instead, talk about the classification parameters. Those are your sensitivity and your specificity, right? Sensitivity meaning if you are truly, in this case, exposed, what are the chances that you will test positive for the exposure? And test here, I use that term generically. That could be just, I ask you, did you smoke during pregnancy? And specificity is amongst those who are truly unexposed. What are the probability that I would classify them as unexposed? If I have information on the sensitivity and specificity, then I can use bias analysis methods to estimate what the data would have been had the bias been absent. And about it, just worth noting, only for later, that while I haven't defined, I haven't focused on the predictive values, predictive values are just given you test positive, what are the chances you're truly positive? Negative predictive value giving you test negative. What are the chances you test negative? And there's this nice relationship between sensitivity and specificity and positive and negative predictive value that we're going to take advantage of later. And the idea is positive predictive value depends on sensitivity, specificity, but also the prevalence, the true prevalence of that exposure. And the same thing with the negative predictive value. Okay, so back to Elisa's data. Elisa has a source of misclassification in her data. And so she wants to say, okay, I have a variable that I know I have misclassification. What would the estimate have been if I know what the estimates of sensitivity and specificity are? What would the data have looked like? So in order to do that, I need information on the bias parameters and I need a model that relates the bias parameters and the observed data to the true data. So here's the problem. Eliza got her information for smoking during pregnancy from a question on the birth certificate. So you can imagine, I mean, I can't imagine, but you can imagine you've just given birth and a doctor comes along and is filling out this birth certificate and says, did you smoke during your pregnancy? You're not gonna get great information about smoking during pregnancy, right? And in fact, there's a very specific problem that we're worried about here. The problem is not specificity. Nobody is concerned that a woman didn't smoke during her pregnancy and a doctor comes along and says, hey, did you smoke during your pregnancy? And she says, well, this doctor will think I'm really cool if I tell him I smoked 
That does not happen because we have had decades and decades of messaging, you shouldn't smoke during your pregnancy. So specificity is gonna be high, probably perfect. In fact, to the extent that it's not perfect, it's probably because somebody didn't understand the question you were asking or the information got transcribed incorrectly. But sensitivity among those who truly smoked, not a lot of people are gonna tell you that they did. In fact, I would argue it's gonna be really bad. My guess is like in the neighborhood of maybe 30% of women who smoke during their pregnancy are actually gonna tell you that they did. Okay, so now imagine you, you write up your study, you submit it to the journal, you're the reviewer, and you look at my study and you say, oh, wait, you got your information of smoking during pregnancy from the birth certificate? Mm, I don't think so, right? Reject, okay? So lisa has got a real problem here, right? If she wants to actually figure out what's the difference between what she observed and what Indus and Myers observed, she's got to actually be able to quantify the impact. Now, this is a case control study done in registry data. So cancer registry, the cancer has actually occurred well after the smoking information. So the misclassification here should be non-differential because the breast cancer hasn't occurred yet. But still, it's not gonna be very good. Well, Elisa could actually go to the literature because there have been a number of studies that have looked at smoking classification. These are not perfect analogies because it doesn't, none of these studies is exactly the same as the kinds of questions Eliza was asking, but it gives us an idea. And if you look on the far right, you can see, as predicted, specificity is very high. People don't tell you they smoked during pregnancy when they didn't. But sensitivity, Ooh, some studies it was 87, 88%. Some studies it was 29%. Now you're free to decide what you think is the best estimate, I am gonna go with 29% personally. But you're free to go with anything you want because with a set of assumptions, we can actually quantify the impact. Now, we don't generally do this in epidemiology, right? If I'm the reviewer of your study, I just look at the problem, I see it listed in the limitation section, I make a judgment call. If I'm making the judgment call to reject your paper, then presumably, I am doing something with your result in my head. I'm saying, ah, you observed the no, you had all this misclassification. So I don't know, I'm gonna guess the truth is, I don't know, three, and you've got it completely wrong. Or maybe it's five, or maybe it's 10, I don't know. But presumably I'm doing something, right? I, actually, we probably aren't doing that, right? But that is what we have been told is the reason you don't need to do any quantification is because we have training in this, we do it in our heads. In actuality, we just look at it and say, that's bad, reject. If we do that, it would be nice if we were actually getting it right when we rejected things. So let's actually quantify the impact and figure out if we're getting it right, right? How far off are we? So I'm gonna ask you to actually do this. In your head, I'm never gonna ask you to share this with anybody, but in your head, shift that point estimate for you. Now that I've told you, Sensitivity is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.3. Make an adjustment to Elisa's point estimate. Did she get all the way to what Innes and Byers found? Five or three, two, or only one, 1.5? Make a, commit to a number in your head, your best guess, because we wanna be able to compare that back to what we actually observe when we quantify. So in order to be able to quantify the impact, we need a model that relates the observed data to what the true data would have been. And it's really easy to understand in the expectation what the data would have looked like if we know the truth and we have misclassified the data with some value of sensitivity and specificity, right? The number of people who will be classified as exposed cases is gonna be A times the sensitivity plus B times one minus the specificity. And I can do that for all the four cells, but I don't live in the world where I have the true data. I live in the world where I have the observed data. So I can reverse this and I end up with a pretty simple formula that will allow me to go from the observed data back to the expected truth 
given a set of values for sensitivity and specificity. For the A cell, it's just going to be A minus one minus specificity times the total cases divided by sensitivity minus one minus specificity. And follow that forward, you have a formula that is not very complicated, right? So the math here is not complicated at all. I would argue the fact that we don't do it just indicates that we are not incentivized to do it. It's not that it's actually hard to do. So you don't even have to memorize those formulas because we have taken all the formulas, pre-programmed them into spreadsheets for you. So just go to our website, download the spreadsheet for misclassification, plug in the numbers, and you're done. Couldn't be easier. Okay. So let's actually do that with Elisa's data. Let's say I believe the sensitivity is 30% and the specificity is 99 or 100%, whatever we think it is. Well, let's take one of the higher estimates for sensitivity. One of the higher estimates was 78% and I'll assume specificity is 99%. Well, I can take Elisa's data and I can plug in the values for sensitivity and specificity use the formula on the right to get back to, it says truth, right? But it isn't the truth. It's my best guess at the truth, given a set of assumptions about the sensitivity and specificity. So under these assumptions, I go from a odds ratio of 0.954 to an odds ratio of 0.949. Really not much of a change. It actually didn't change very much at all. But fair enough, right? I use 78%, and I don't think the sensitivity is actually 78%. I actually think it's way worse. Okay, so now we can just change the numbers. Here's a table of results, bias adjusted, under a set of values for sensitivity and specificity. So in the top three, we've left specificity as perfect. In the bottom three, We've set specificity at 90%. And then I've changed the sensitivity from 99% to 50% to 25%. Take a look at the bias adjusted odds ratios. They barely move. And to the extent that they move, they actually move in the wrong direction, right? They move in the direction that nobody would consider plausible. That smoking during pregnancy is protective against incident breast cancer, and nobody thinks that's true. Does this comport with whatever you, in your head, made as the adjustment for the point estimate? Is it close to what you got in your head? I said I wasn't going to make you share it aloud, so I'm going to stick to that. But I'm going to guess the answer is no. But now think back, right? If you were the reviewer of Elisa's paper and you find out that she has a terrible measure of smoking during pregnancy, you're going to reject her paper. When in fact, regardless of the value of sensitivity, and to be fair, I don't consider 90% specificity to be in any way plausible. So I'm really looking at the top three. It doesn't matter what the estimate, the value is for sensitivity. This result changes almost not at all until sensitivity gets very low, and then it moves in a direction we wouldn't actually consider plausible. This doesn't happen to happen, right? This is a case where terrible sensitivity creates almost no bias in the point estimate. There are other cases where very small amounts of error in classification leads to very large amounts of bias in the point estimates. And unless we have built really good intuitions, we don't know which one we're in until we classify, sorry, quantify. So if we don't go through the effort of actually quantifying, we might go and throw out Elise's data and say, we don't believe you. We don't actually think this is a good study. Now, fair enough, right? I, I'm not suggesting it's a good measure. I'm also not suggesting her results are correct. What I am suggesting is the reason that her results are wrong, if they are wrong, is not 
because of her measure of smoking during pregnancy. And what that means is not only do we now know that smoking being misclassified on the birth certificate in the way that it is does not lead to much, if any, noticeable bias, it also tells us that, okay, now we have two results. In is a buyer's five, Aliza null. If we want to figure out which one of them, if any of them is correct, we're going to need to do another study. And if we're going to need to do another study, we're going to have to write a grant. And in that grant, we are going to have to say where we're going to use the resources, the money that we get. Well, here was a problem, right? Smoking during pregnancy. We could say, well, when we do the next study, let's get a better estimate of smoking during pregnancy. And to do that, it's going to be expensive. We're going to put all of our resources into that at the expense of other things that we could have done. That would be a huge waste of money. So not only do we learn something in quantifying about the study itself, we also learn how to advance as a field in being able to answer questions. Because in this case, spending more money on getting better measures of our exposure will not improve our ability to answer the question. Again, I'm not trying to suggest this is universal. It's not. Sometimes very small amounts of measurement error have very large impacts on our results. And we never know until we actually go through the exercise of quantifying. I would argue that everything we have done here is incredibly simple. Anybody could do it. And yet, I would argue, we have learned a ton by actually going through the exercise. So why we don't do it, I'm not clear. So this is actually just a plot of Elisa's result in which I'm now taking those two values of fixed specificity and looking at all values of sensitivity. And what you notice is, again, until you get to really low sensitivity, the results don't change. So, okay, it's not a good measure of smoking during pregnancy. But because specificity is really high, it really doesn't matter what sensitivity is. And we learn that by actually going through the exercise of quantifying the impact. Now, it's worth noting that is what we refer to as simple bias analysis. Simple bias analysis meaning we take a set of bias parameters, we bias adjust the data, we draw conclusions about the results. The problem with that is, though, we don't know if we're right, right? The values that we chose for sensitivity and specificity, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. I looked at, you know, if you looked at Elisa's table of validation data, there were a lot of possible results. So who knows which one is right? I have hypotheses that the lower ones are more likely to be right, but I don't know for sure. So what I can do is now do what we refer to as probabilistic bias analysis, in which rather than just doing that simple bias analysis, in which I choose a value for the bias parameters or a couple of values, I can actually put distributions that express my uncertainty in the bias parameters. They are effectively priors as one would do in a Bayesian analysis. It's not a Bayesian analysis, so I'm not gonna call it that. But I'm gonna put priors on my uncertainty in those bias parameters as one would do in a Bayesian analysis. And then I can sample from those distributions, Monte Carlo simulations, sample from the bias parameters, do the bias analysis over and over and over, and then get a distribution of results. By getting a distribution of results, now I can have a measure of central tendency, right? I can find the midpoint of that distribution and look on average, how much does the point estimate shift? But I can also look where 95% of that distribution lies and use that as a analogy, uh, 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 similar to a 95% confidence interval. So now I can express my uncertainty in the results because of my uncertainty in the bias parameters. And also just to note, I can also then incorporate random error back in so that I can have one estimate that accounts for both the systematic and the random error. 
So as I said, you know, we're going to do this through Monte Carlo simulations. Um, you can actually do this in spreadsheets that we have available online, but those are really for demonstration purposes. Running simulations in Excel is not efficient. You can run a thousand simulations in about 10 minutes. In Excel, SAS, Stata, or R, you can run a million simulations in a few seconds. So you're going to want to switch over to actual programming. But the other thing is you can do this in summary level data or record level data. So I can use anybody's two by two table and I can do the bias analysis. Or I could do the bias analysis in my own data set with record level data. The advantage there being I can do some really complicated models and I can adjust for additional confounders. So ultimately that's probably where I'm gonna go. But for this, there really was no measured confounding and all she was calculating was an odds ratio. So I don't really need that. So to do that, I need a few distributions. First one is the binomial distributions. That's just the distribution that we get for a series of coin flips. So if I flip a coin 100 times with a probability of coming up heads 50%, I get the distribution on the top, right? Most likely I'm gonna get 50 heads, but you wouldn't be surprised if you got 49 or 48 or 47 but you'd be pretty surprised if you got 30. So we're gonna use that distribution and that has two parameters, a probability and a number of coin flips. And then I need the beta distribution. Beta has two parameters, alpha and beta. And beta is one of those distributions, if you know it, you love it. And if it's new to you, it seems weird. But all you need to know about beta for right now is beta has a mean at alpha divided by alpha plus beta. And that is important because if I have data that I want to simulate, and I know the number of people say for sensitivity who tested positive and the number of people test negative, I can set those numbers as alpha and beta, and I will get a distribution centered on whatever the actual sensitivity and specificity are. Okay. So here's what we do for probabilistic bias analysis. I start off with a summary two by two table. Even if I'm gonna do record level adjustments, I'm still gonna start with a summarized two by two table. And then I'm gonna put in some distributions around the bias parameters. I don't wanna get too caught up in how we specify those distributions. So let's just think of those as uniform distributions. Just give me a range, right? For Lisa's, I think the sensitivity was somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5. And I think the specificity was between 0.98 and 100. Then I'm just gonna randomly choose values of the sensitivity and specificity. And then I'm gonna take those values and I'm gonna turn the observed data, that summary two by two table, into a bias adjusted analysis using the values of sensitivity and specificity that I just drew. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because I need that information to end up with the probability that someone was misclassified. Because remember, the values that I'm using are sensitivity and specificity. But sens sensitivity and specificity have truth as the denominator. I have people already classified. I need the predictive values. That's the probability given you were classified as exposed, what are the chances you were correctly classified? Well, there's a formula that I can use to turn sensitivity and specificity into positive and negative predictive value, but it requires that I know the true prevalence of the exposure. And I don't know the true prevalence of the exposure because that's the thing that is misclassified. But if I do the simple bias analysis first, I can estimate what that prevalence is and I can use that prevalence to turn sensitivity and specificity into the positive and negative predictive values. I do that with some additional simulation of some random error. So I use that beta distribution to actually draw from a distribution for the prevalence because I don't know that in the end I get it right. But now I'm gonna have four predictive values, a positive predictive value for the cases, a positive predictive value for the controls, a negative predictive value for the cases, and the negative predictive value for the controls. Now I just look to see, okay, if you were an exposed case, then the positive predictive value is the probability that your exposure was correctly classified. If you're an unexposed non-case, then the negative predictive value amongst the controls 
is your probability of being misclassified. So now I just flip a coin with a probability equal to whatever the appropriate predictive value is. And if it comes up heads, I say you're correctly classified. If it comes up tails, I reclassify you. But I could do that over and over and over, or I could just use that binomial distribution and say, okay, for everybody who was classified as an exposed case, flip a coin with a probability equal to the positive predictive value amongst the cases. If it comes up heads for each person, you know, how many are correctly classified, how many are reclassified. Now I have one bias adjusted estimate. I can summarize that any way I want. Risk ratio, relative risk, odds ratio. Now I'm gonna save that estimate, but that is only one set of values that I could have chosen from those distributions. And I wanna know about all of the possible values. So I do this again and again, and I do it 50,000 times, 100,000 times. In summary level, it's so easy and takes up very little computing power, I can run a million in seconds. So I'm gonna run a million simulations so that I can realize every or almost every possible combination of sensitivity and specificity. Then, now I have a distribution of a million bias adjusted results. I can summarize that by finding the median value and using that as my point estimate. And I can look where the 2.5th percentiles of that distribution and the 97.5th percentiles of the distribution are. And I can use that as a interval that summarizes my uncertainty in the results based on the fact that I don't know with precision what the values of sensitivity and specificity are. I can also create another interval in which I add back in the random error by taking the conventional standard error and for each bias adjusted estimate, subtracting off a draw from a standard normal distribution, multiplying it by the conventional standard error, and that's just gonna add in the random error around all of the systematic error adjusted estimates. So now, as I say to you, we have a tool you can do this if you want to in Excel. I would argue you don't wanna do this in Excel, but it's great for sort of visually understanding what the underlying math is doing. You're gonna to wanna to move over to SAS or Stata or R, and we've got code for SAS and R. Apologies to you Stata users. Neither Rich nor I are good at Stata, so we couldn't do that. And it's meant to be simplified code that you can readily adapt to your particular bias analysis. So now I'm gonna assume for Elise's data, that I can summarize my uncertainty in the sensitivity using a beta distribution with alpha of 30 and beta of 70. Those numbers don't mean anything to you, I know. But what you're looking at here in the middle is what that distribution looks like. If alpha is 30 and beta is 70, the midpoint of that distribution, the mean, mean value, is gonna be 30 divided by 30 plus 70, 30%. In other words, this is my way of saying, I believe the most likely value is 30%, but I will accept that it could be as high as, in this case, say 40, 45% and as low as 10%. And for specificity, I'm gonna use alpha of 99 and beta of one, which means I think the most likely value for specificity is 99%. And then I'm gonna run a million simulations and summarize the results. I told you, we have SAS code, we have R code. I am showing you the SAS code here, not because anybody cares about my SAS code, to simply show you this is the entirety of the simulation. That's it, right? This is, again, not that hard. So if you wanna adapt this to your analysis, it is not hard to do. We're not talking about lines and lines of code. And here's the results. Sorry that my face appears over some of the results. So if you look on the bottom, what you're looking at, or sorry, the bottom of the figure, the top of the table, those are the conventional results. Those are the results that only account for random error. That was Elisa's point estimate of 0.95 with a 95% confidence interval from 0.81 to 1.13. The second estimate in the middle in the figure is all of the 1 million simulations 
accounting only for the systematic error. You can see the point estimate on average drops to 0.93, but those results don't vary very much. 95% of the distribution of bias adjusted results are between 90% and 94%. Then the last one is the result where I added back in the random error. So that's total error. Now I've got the systematic error and the random error. You can see the point estimate for the total error is the same as the systematic error. That is what we would expect because I'm just adding in noise around the systematic error estimates. <clears throat> now, my point estimate is 0.93, 95% of the distribution goes from 0.77 to 1.1, 1 1.11. 1 which is to say, okay, what are the three, th three things we care about? Direction, magnitude, and uncertainty. Direction, how much did the point estimate shift? And in, oh, sorry, what direction did the point estimate shift? The bias was towards the null. So the point estimate moved away from the null. Magnitude, how much? Not much, not much at all. I can be pretty confident in that point estimate if this is the only source of systematic error and my assumptions about the bias parameters are correct. You just notice there's a missing zero. You've probably been staring at the missing zero. Oh, it's gonna bother me. And then the total error, oh, sorry. And then the last one, uncertainty. How much more uncertain should I be in my results because I had to account for this source of systematic error analytically? What you're looking on the far right, where it says width of confidence, width of interval, is showing you the ratio of the upper to the lower limit. So you can see the random error, the conventional analysis, had a width of 1.39. The systematic error interval was very narrow. After I account for the systematic error and the random error, I am less certain in my results. But because the point estimates don't actually move very much, even though I'm pretty uncertain as to what the value for sensitivity is, because the point estimates don't change very much, I am less certain in my results, but I'm not dramatically less certain in my results. Now, again, I just wanna be clear, this is one example. In other examples that we have done, small amounts of misclassification leads to large shifts in the point estimate and small amounts of uncertainty in the bias parameters leads to large amounts of additional uncertainty. The point is, we never know until we do the analysis, but by doing the analysis, we improve our ability to estimate cause and effect should it exist. So again, direction, magnitude, and uncertainty. Those are the three things that we care about. Which direction did the point estimate move? How much did it move? And how much less certain should we be in our results because we had to account for a source of residual systematic error analytically? So I'll stop there, but I do just wanna make the point. These methods are not very complicated. They are not hard to implement. I think the reason we don't use them is because we're not required to use them. Nobody insists that we use them. We insist people quantify random error. We insist people adjust for known measured confounders and everything else we just give a pass to. I think we can do better. And I think by doing so, hopefully I've illustrated to you that our intuitions about sources of bias and their impact on study results are not always very good. And therefore, if we actually go through the effort of quantifying the impact, I think we as a field will get ourselves into fewer situations, like Ioannidis says, where most published research findings are false. So I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions.